Welcome to Legion Radio, a podcast about all things e-commerce. The official podcast of the Private Label Legion, hosted by Tim Jordan. Welcome to another episode of Legion Radio, the official podcast of the Private Label Legion community, where we're talking about all sorts of crap, but mostly e-commerce, which is relevant, I guess. Um, but, you know, some other crap mixed in. Anyways, today we have Katie Richardson, who is not only a... I was going to make up something. What can we make up? Can you can you give, like, a description of yourself completely made up? Like, not only is she a professional um, wallaby welder wrangler... But, oh, welder. welder. There you go. Oh, no, you are true. a welder and woodworker? <laughs> well, that kind of takes all the speed out of my whole thing. Yeah. Mother so. of four. Well, I'm, I'm walking away now. This episode's done because we just completely killed the intro. No. <laughs> um, so Katie is on here. She is a self-proclaimed, and I say self-proclaimed, um, she's also probably like a others proclaimed branding expert, so to speak. And she has a really cool story about how she got started in not just e-commerce, but commerce, right? Just selling stuff. And totally. she sold a lot of products. How many different products, like units of product do you think you've sold in the past, I don't know, 10 years? Can you even put uh, a number on it? That's a good question. I know that I have over a million customers. How's that? That's a lot of customers. All right. That's yeah. awesome. So uh, she's done big things. She's done um, sales multinationally. She's gone online. She's gone offline. You have made some celebrity appearances, right? On some pretty I big have. names and pretty big shows. We'll talk about yeah. that in a second. Um, mother of four, you obviously work some with your husband, which is kind of cool. A lot of people in this industry are scared to death to work with their spouse. I guess uh, you've tackled that. And so far you haven't killed each other yet. So because hey, either you've gone or you'd be in jail. So one of the two. Um, awesome. So let's get to jump right in. So Katie, tell us a little about how you got started selling our products. Actually, don't do that. What were you doing before you started selling products? Oh, that's the best story, Tim. Good. Awesome. Um, nobody it. asked that question. So I actually never got into this because I wanted to be an entrepreneur or a business person. I just, I was somebody who really liked making things. And how did I even get into this is I was in a boutique with my kids and my kids were using some of the products that I had made and the boutique owner just, she just uh, attacked me and said, where'd you get all this stuff? I go to all the trade shows and this is hot. And I was like, oh, you like it? Thanks. I made it. I was just, I was really unsure of myself and kind of timid, honestly. And she said, I want you to make this for me. And I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm, I'm not like a business person. I don't know anything about business. And um, long story short, I shared that story with my husband, who's extremely entrepreneurial. He was like, Katie, we got to make this for the store owner. And I said, I don't have time. I had two kids and knew we were going to have more. And he was like, no, you're not going to make it. Somebody else will make it. You just need to ask her how many she wants. So that's how I got started. Nice. Do you want to share what that was? So the product at the time was some soft goods products. It was a baby carrier that was just made of a really simple fabric design that I had created. And so I did, I found a manufacturer a couple hours from my home and had him make the first hundred. And I sold out of them in like a week between the boutiques in Portland and my husband and I were like, I was, I was doing this on the side, right. During nap time. And when my kids were asleep <laughs> and over a Christmas break, my husband, who's also a product designer, he said, Katie, let's design something together that will actually allow me to quit my job. And we can do this together full time. And so over a Christmas break, we did, we had that two week period and we were drawing and sketching and prototyping. And we came up with something that we thought was really good and handed it to some girlfriends and said, Hey, test this out for us. And it was an infant bathtub that would hang in store flat and it folded into a little cushion seat that fit into your bathroom sink. And unlike a sponge, it was, it was soft and warm, but it didn't absorb water. So then so you didn't, didn't get have nasty. The mold. Yeah. Yes. You didn't have the mold and the mildew. And honestly, Tim, what we did is we just made a list of everything that we hated yep. with the current bathing solutions. And we just yep. said, what's like the super awesome, most amazing ideal bathing solution. What would that look like? And so we made our dream list and essentially that's where the product design was born out of was what are the requirements for this? And we made this prototype. My girlfriends didn't want to give it back. I just had one prototype. And, um, yeah, so like this was kind of our product that we knew was going to change the game for us. Well, you jumped in deep. I mean, I'm thinking of a lot of, <laughs> a lot of things here. One baby carriers, 
I mean, if, if the first thing you really sold and I realize, I'm guessing that's not the first one you scaled up on the first one you probably scaled up on was the, the bathing device, but baby carriers are tough. Um, it's a little bit of a saturated market. You know, there's a lot of options. A lot of the big brand names are, are possessing a lot of that retail shelf space, but also there's some other considerations to, to think about there, you know, CPSC stuff, um, liability oh, yeah. stuff, you know, there's all sorts of lawsuits coming down on, you know, the, the, it's not hip dysplasia. That's what happens to German shepherds. But like the, uh, the, what, it, you know more about it when I'm thinking, you know, like <laughs> my wife is crazy about some carry. She's like, no, it makes her legs sit funny. It messes up their hips. So yeah. I suspect that you're very familiar with that. So, I mean, baby carries is tough because there's so much involved there. And then of course, you know, the bathing stuff, there's a lot of stuff there too. You've got yeah. the health and safety aspect. You've got the liability aspect, you know, a uh, crap. I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure you you Tons probably didn't even, of safety requirements yes. in any baby product. Tons. And developing a new product. That's tough. I mean, most yeah. people that get involved in e-commerce, they're, you know, taking an already existing product and selling it better or making a small improvement. But starting from scratch, literally sketching up something, that's, yeah. uh, that's a lot of work. I mean, I a know. lot of work. <laughs> it's not so normal. So you jumped in freaking deep. You want to know why we started with the baby carrier? Because you were trying to solve a problem and you had a problem? Well, right. yeah, there was that, but manufacturing was super simple, right? It yeah. was a cut and sew product. And so I could, I could get small orders and get that manufactured for a decent price. Whereas something like this bathtub that we knew was going to be a game changer, we were literally machining a tool out of metal. And that, <laughs> like, that requires way higher minimums in order to operate with a factory like that. And so that was a totally different game, right? And so we were able to start with, with low production run with this soft goods product. That's so important. And that's one thing that we teach a lot is kind of, um, you know, crawl before you walk, walk before you run and low MOQs, getting your feet wet before just diving in is so important. Yeah. And that fabric sling was U.S. manufactured. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. That's awesome. So, so it was just, it was local, it was fast, it was low minimums and it was just quick and easy to make. So you've got this bath thing, right? That also folds into a sink thing. So like a bathy (laughs) sinky thing and you're, you're betting the horse on this product, right? Your husband's still working full time. He wants this thing to bring him home. Right. So I'm making a lot of assumptions. Tell me if I'm wrong. So he wants this, this non moldy bathy but think of the bathtub, Tim, since this is like audio, think of the bathtub as a brown paper sack. Okay. That is something that folds flat, right? Yeah. And it pops open to hold volume. Okay. Nobody has to hand you any instructions on how to operate it. That's true. And it's so simple. It's actually really brilliant, right? When you think okay. about it. Got it. Did you get a patent on this thing? Absolutely. Oh my gosh. So you're part of the fun. diving in even just, deeper. This, this soft goods product was not just funding the development of the game changer, right? The bathtub, but it was also funding the whole patent process. Cause you can't, when you're, when you're filing for a patent, you can't be selling your product, right? It, it essentially has to be invisible yep. and you pay for all of that up front. Yep. Got it. All right. So I'm assuming that if we skip forward in the story that this bathtub is a thing that launched you, this is a thing that like went bananas, yes, right? No. Yes and no. Everybody needs to hear this piece of the story. And it's kind of the unexpected piece. I could jump to the piece where it just explodes and it takes off. But I really feel like everybody needs to hear this other piece of the story. So for two years, you know, I had two young kids and planning on having more. We were selling this fabric carrier, low production, but I was selling it in a lot of boutiques in the U.S. And we were you know, taking on odd jobs just to pay for the patent process of this product that we felt was going to be a game changer. And so, like I did my research and I, I realized that there was a show in New York and I needed to take it to this show. This was the show that was going to have the big buyers because like I said, right, I needed high volume. And so I needed some orders from big retailers in order to make this all work. So I was pregnant with my third at the time. We didn't have the money, Tim, but you know, you put it on credit cards or do whatever you have to do. I go to the show and I'm in a really great booth with a very reputable sales rep who's bringing in all the big buyers. And they're asking me all these questions like, what are your minimums? What's your wholesale price? What's your retail price? What does the retail package look like? Do you carry insurance? Um, What are your lead times? All these things. And honestly, Tim, I was way out of my league. Like, (laughs) I had been doing U.S. manufacturing, low production, selling to boutiques, and they were asking me questions I didn't have an answer to. 
And I was doing my best to answer all of their questions. But at the end of the day, I came home from that New York show, flipping through all of my orders. There were zero orders for this bathtub. It was devastating, devastating. Keep in mind, we'd put almost two years into this and Mm -hmm. put our own money towards patents of this product that at the end of the day, nobody placed an order for. I was devastated. And I came home feeling like a complete and total failure, um, totally broke and just broke in and really frustrated and feeling like, man, how could I have been stupid to think that this was going to be something that people was would be excited about that they would think was real, that they would trust and actually place place an order for. So I come home from that show devastated and I have to face my husband and tell him we got no orders for this. And he was really quiet and thought about it for a second. And he said, Katie, they actually didn't tell you no. They just asked a bunch of questions that you didn't, we didn't have the answers to. All we have to do is answer those questions and we'll be shipping this thing all over the world. And I was like, Oh my gosh, He's right. And I hate it. <laughs> so, so what I you were so calling tired. a failure was the education you needed to have. That failure was my perfect blueprint to success. Yeah. Nice. And so that's what we chose to do. And while it looked crazy to everybody else, we literally just went down the list and every question that they asked me, I went and I answered, like I went on the hunt and I learned this game. Um, retail and just selling products in general, it's not for novices and you have to know what you're doing and you have to be able to play the game. And there are things that are even intangible that is part of this, Tim. And I, I, I got very clear that I was going to master this and I wasn't going to just kind of dip my toe that if I really wanted the work, this to work, I was going to have to go all in. And that's what we did. We answered all those questions. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. So, so fast forward as to like, you start getting some sales, right? And this is all brick and mortar well, stuff. Well, here's Probably the fast killing. forward, fast forward almost a year later. And we take it back to the trade show. And again, like we're at this show. And if anybody's ever been to a trade show, everyone around you is like drywalling and painting and nails and saws. Yep. They're practically building a house. And I'm working from a budget of Amex pretty much. <laughs> and just being super, super creative. And I, it's just me and my husband and my, I convinced my best friend to come work for me for free for a week. And she did. And we were putting up our booth and the whole time I'm just like, Oh my gosh, everyone's going to see right through us that I'm just some stay at home mom who just weaned her third child who has no <laughs> idea what she's doing and isn't really a businesswoman. I was terrified of all of these things. And so for two days we're setting up, this show opens and the booth is packed, Tim. Everybody has all these questions about the latest innovation in baby bathing. Everybody wants to know the whole story. And like person after person is saying, this is brilliant. I can't believe I've never seen this before. Like it was just, it changed that moment changed my like life. And we went from being nobodies essentially and not existing to being in over 2000 stores in the U S and we flew from there to Germany and attended a global show, literally that, that like same week. (laughs) And we, we got ourselves distribution in over 26 different countries. So So like my life changed in that week. So what was the difference in that year? Because the first year they're asking about MOQs and the next year they're like asking about the actual product itself. Like, did you do branding in between that year? Like, like what actually filled the booth the second time around? Here was the thing that was missing the first time around was all of the things. It's like the wrapper and the packaging and the messaging and the story and even the brand and the, and the story behind the brand. And it was everything that makes the product feel real, believable, trustworthy. And here's the thing, like, even if a consumer experiences the product and trusts it on the retail level, it's a different game. They need to know that you have a good relationship with your factories, that you have funding, that you're going to not be out of stock. And so creating trust between the retailers is also part of the game. And we, we mastered that Tim. And like, clearly, clearly we mastered it because we were, I was literally still shipping out of my garage. I was in conversation with the factory, but I didn't have the funding all set up, but we had, we had set ourselves up in a way that it was real and it was believable. So it sounds like you've got, yeah. So you've got two important components here. One, you've got a good product Two, you've got good branding. Would you say that one is more important than the other? 
Um, that's a good question. Definitely. Um, I like as a product designer, I feel like having a, an amazing product is just uh, a must. It stakes to playing the game. But if you want to be the very best, you have to understand how to create a real brand. There are actually a lot of really amazing products out there that don't make it because they don't understand brands. They don't understand marketing. And There's also sad. some really crappy products out there that make it because good branding. Yes. So, okay. Got it. So branding. Yeah. So let's talk about branding because um, I'm speaking probably for most of our listeners here. Um, e-commerce entrepreneurs, right? Either have bootstrapped this thing and started, or they're thinking about getting started. They're trying to figure out the next step. And there's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of information like of so what's important, noise. you know, what's a priority? Like what is, what is more important than the other? And I will say that most people probably cannot start this journey the same way you did. Most people are not going right. to have like a brilliant product idea. They can't design something. They probably can't really afford to um, sink a bunch of money into patent searches and you know, all that crazy stuff. Yeah. So let's say that, um, and I think this is a fair assumption that most people are looking for a product that uh, is fairly low barrier to entry, but they want to stand out. And what you're saying is the way to stand out is definitely branding. But, yeah. but here's a caveat. Most business models now for like startup e-com product entrepreneurs involve Amazon, right? Sure. Amazon limits some of the branding. Okay. Amazon, because we have to play within their box, makes it a little bit tough sometimes to actually tell our full brand story, right? To, to really brand the way that we want to. So sure. I know that you have, um, you do a lot of coaching, consulting. You also have a mastermind program where you talk a lot about this, you know, brand development and branding for products, you know, to scale businesses. Um, I suspect that you have a lot of um, students, a lot of, um, you know, mastermind members that also sell on Amazon. So you probably have a pretty good idea of some of the ways in which we can create that brand story and that brand presence on Amazon. Would that be a fair statement? Absolutely. All right. So let's talk about that. And then we'll talk a little bit about off Amazon. So can you come up with like three things you see that make a huge impact on people's brand awareness and branding on Amazon that most people aren't even thinking about doing? Like, what are the three things that if you can get in front of 5,000 people right now and say, hey, morons, listen, like you're not doing this, but you should be doing this on Amazon. What would be some of those things that you would share? I think one of the mistakes that a lot of times people make is they're so focused on text and copy and what they're saying. And while that stuff is important, there is so much weight that people are not paying attention to and focusing on to the intangibles, the intangibles. When somebody is on the page, how does it make them feel, Tim? Not just what is it saying to them, but how does it make it them feel? Can I tell you that people don't do what you tell them to do or what they want to do? They do what they feel yeah, like it's, a, it's emotionally driven. So how do we, yes. so, so let me back up. You're saying they're so focused on the copy and text and copy and text is one of the ways in which we make people feel. Were you saying they're too tied up in like the, the tactical specifics Science. are too worried about keyword stuffing. They're worried about, you know, the optimization, ranking, indexing, bull crap, and not worried about actually yeah. selling. Um, I recently okay. did a podcast interview with example. Bradley Sutton and that's what he said is he said, you know, people are so worried about ranking and they forget to just be good salesmen. Yeah. Okay. Let me give you a, a good example because okay. one of the things that we talk a lot about about in my mastermind is both the art and the science of building a brand. Okay. And there's kind of these direct marketing is a really good example of like all text, right? It's putting out a very clear message and trying to get people to take a very specific action. And it's very text driven. It's very copy focused. And then there's the opposite side where you'll be flipping through a magazine and there is a close up of a curve of a light, a headlight on a Jaguar. And at the bottom, all it says is Jaguar. There, there's no call to action. Right. And so these are kind of two opposite ends of the spectrum. One is shouting at you, telling you exactly what to do. The other one is what we call performance art, where it's, it's like so focused on the feeling but it almost leaves people a little bit lost. Like, okay, that's really cool. What am I supposed to do about that? And we really believe that if you can know and understand the things that work from both the art and the science and you combine them, it's extremely powerful. And so it's this combination of not just knowing what to say, but what not to say. Like what other words can I take out of my copy, right? 
And how can I distill this down into ex- like what it needs to say and then nothing more? And at the same time, how can I combine that with the visuals and the imagery that creates the emotion that I'm trying to convey to my potential buyer? Got it. I think. So you're more artistic than me. Like my brain still wants to fight towards like, you know, the, the more, I won't say masculine, but like the more bold and direct stuff. And you, and you're, you know, the more science, I guess, and you're talking more about art. So that's, that's really hard for talking about the cross section, Tim, the cross section where it begins section. Cause like, absolutely. You gotta be watching your numbers. You need to know where you're ranking. You need, you, you even need to know what your, your competition is doing and where there's ranking and what you can do to improve your ranking. You need to know all of those things, but you also need to know and understand the art of brand. Got it. All right. So what's another Look at everybody who's winning and they're doing both extremely well. And do you think that more of that art can be conveyed in like written description or in images specifically on Amazon? Which one do you think holds more weight when it comes to like the ability to, to, to find that cross section? Both. I don't limit it to just the copy or just the imagery. I feel like somebody who can, like I had said before, somebody who knows what words to take away so that it speaks very clearly and distinctly. We live in such a busy, noisy world. And when we're too wordy, it's just confusing. And so when you can look at a paragraph or a sentence and say, what, uh, what other words can I take out of here and just really distill it down to the only thing that it needs to say, it just really focuses our message. Yeah, makes sense. So what's another just boneheaded mistake you see people making all the time when it comes to not branding well enough or or forgetting a simple branding, um, you know, tactic on their Amazon listings? They're too focused on their product and not actually on who they're talking to. It's really important to know some are really, really and enter the conversation that they're already having in their head, right? So that when we show up, we feel very familiar and like a friend and somebody that they can trust, um, somebody that who is going to provide quality and value to them. Um, these are really important things. And again, like the intangibles play into this, Tim. Yeah. Got so it. Knowing, knowing our customer is really, really important. Sometimes like we find an awesome product and we think, I'm just going to throw this on Amazon. It's selling really well for everybody else. And if we just throw it up there, like everybody else with product description and all that kind of stuff, it's not going to rise above all of the other noise, right? It's just going to get caught in everybody else's same features and product description. But when we know, and we understand who we're talking to and we speak to them, just like I would to a friend, right? Then suddenly they're, they're feeling something again. That's like that plays into the intangibles. So So, knowing who we're talking to. So it's simple, right? Like it's not simple, but I'm breaking down to simple. I'm like, once you find that cross section of, of the, the data and the science or the the science and the emotion, and, and we, you know, find where all those things meet, um, that's when things start getting crazy for us. Right. And I know that some things went crazy for you. I know that um, not only when you figured out, you know, that cross section between a good product and good branding and you started selling out, you know, that, that one week that changed your life, but you started getting some free publicity, right? So let's talk about that. Like, like, this is the other piece that I wanted to share with you is so often we feel like we have to go stand in line and play the game the way everybody else does. And when we do it that way, Again, we just kind of get lost in the crowd. And we, we honestly, we couldn't play the game everybody else was playing. I didn't have the funding. And so I had to get creative in my approach. And I didn't have the money to go chase my customers. I didn't. I didn't have the money to go chase the media. It was just me and my husband in the very beginning. And so I had to figure out a way to get all of them coming to us. And so this was kind of the formula that we developed was how can we capture people's attention that has them opening up Google and typing in our name? How can we capture people's attention in a way that has them telling their girlfriends about us? How can we capture their attention in a way that like we 
can I tell you how many times I've ended up on national TV and I haven't paid for it, Tim? Like I was on the Allen show, the Rachel Ray show, the Today show multiple times. I've been on the cover of Entrepreneur Magazine. And the craziest thing is they all came to us. I didn't go chasing any of them. That's awesome. Yeah. And this all started out literally like in your garage. Literally in my garage, which was freezing cold because I live in the Pacific Northwest and it was over Christmas break, like I said. Yeah. Well, that's important. And those of you listening need to need to hear this. I mean, like Katie's here telling us all this great stuff. You know, she's selling in, you know, 726 different countries on, you know, 71 continents. And I mean, that's all great stuff, right? Um, you know, been on Ellen and Rachel Ray and the Today Show and all this good stuff. But dude, it started in your garage, like just in your garage. And it started out literally with an idea that you had while, you know, probably trying to figure out how to drain out this big plastic baby oh bath that there's like, it takes up, you know, half of your living room because it's so yes. big and bulky. This stuff is, it, it starts out simply. And, and, you know, there's so many people that are discouraged because, you know, they want to get in this e-commerce game. They want to sell products. They, they want to yeah. make some extra money, whether it's just an extra car payment or, you know, quit their job. And sure. it's not complicated. It's, it's complex because there's lots of little pieces to go into it, but each little piece is not complicated. I mean, tell a good brand story, fix a problem, have a decent product. You know, you stack all these things together and big things can happen, um, which is awesome. So let me pick your brain a little bit more about your branding expertise, because, you know, we know that Amazon's a little bit restricted, you know, playing inside their sandbox and what we can do for branding. And yeah. we have a lot of listeners I know that maybe have one or two products or three or four products and are like ready to start taking that step out of the Amazon sandbox. Like, yeah, like, like I want to make that next step. But there's a lot of noise out there. I mean, that's like stepping out the front door into a blizzard because there's all sorts of crap going on from Google and Facebook to Instagram yeah. to Pinterest to influencers to brick and mortar to like all sorts of crap. So if let, let, let's take this, let's take this like an incremental step first. Okay. I believe that there is power before you take the time to build out a big website and your own infrastructure and stuff. There's power in driving traffic to your Amazon store. I mean, that's totally. like a really easy step. Like you can drive traffic to your Amazon store, let Amazon handle all the bull crap and logistics and all that stuff. Yes. So when it comes to branding, let's say we're just keeping our product housed on Amazon, sold on Amazon. What are just a couple little simple, quick, like 30 second tips that you can give for doing yeah. some off Amazon branding to Amazon? Okay, this is so good. I want to invite everybody who's listening to kind of take a step back because yes, we're selling on Amazon. If you're not on Amazon, you should be. It's it's honestly a really good lead generator. And if we look at it that way, Tim, and kind of take a step back and we say, okay, Amazon is helping me find my customers. And am I shipping the product and just being totally silent from that point on? You, We have an opportunity to continue the conversation with our customers as soon as as they open the box, as soon as they're pulling the product out, either on our packaging, on our messaging, on a brochure that we pop in or, or um, samples or a, a coupon code to their next purchase, but that gets used on our website, right? So this was actually a mistake that I made really early on as I would ship the product and I was just totally silent after that. Um, and I was missing a major opportunity, which was continue the conversation either through in the package, like I described, or continuing to email them, message them and move them into a direction where I can have more direct communication with them. So that was, that's like a big tip that I would give everybody is use Amazon, not just as a seller, but use it like it's an awesome lead generator and continue to market and sell to them in every touch point that you have with them. Think about the experience as your customer and what does that look like and how am I continuing to move them along and share value with them? Yeah, that's really good stuff. Um, and there's a lot of ways you can do that. You can do that from just really good branding and uh, like information on the product itself. Yeah. All the way up, you know, product packaging, yeah. um, you know, make that an experience. I know people that literally design their packaging after like iPhone boxes. So they get that experience of opening this nice box, you know? Yeah. To, I'll give um, you a really good example of this really simple. Um, so one of our product it's, we have the bathtub, it's called the pudge tub. It was very natural for us to do an infant towel and we call it the hug. And inside the box, once you take the product out inside the box, it just was a little note from me that says, give your baby a hug for me, heart Katie. And those kinds of things create an experience, Tim, 
um, people remember that. And suddenly, maybe if they didn't know who Katie was, they're like, who's Katie? Then they go find out the story of Pudge and how I, I, you you know, did this out of my garage with my own kids and how I'm a product designer who has kids. And I understand the problems that they're facing as a parent themselves. And so suddenly there's this emotional connection from the customer to me. Man, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, it's such little things, you know, in, like you said, insert cards, you can also use email follow-ups. You know, there's a lot of services to email follow-ups specifically to Amazon customers where you can put little messages in there and, and tell your brand story. And, and, you know, there are some restrictions. You can't like put links to your external website or anything, but there's a lot you can do. All right. So what about social media? How does social media play into all of this? And at what point in an incremental step from an Amazon quote unquote private label seller, like, how can they start using social media to build a brand presence that will have a pretty immediate impact on their business? Yeah. Anyone who's really good at branding knows that you have to make an emotional connection with your customers. That's what a brand does is it makes people feel something. And so if you are going to move down that direction of creating a powerful brand, and by the way, anyone who's selling on Amazon and and having success there, like that's a huge, huge win, right, Tim? But we can all look out there and see that that game is shifting and changing. And suddenly what used to work within Amazon is now like our margins are getting squeezed and it's suddenly harder to stay on top. And so the next logical step is to create a powerful brand. And, and part of creating a powerful brand is knowing how to tell stories as human beings. We are just wired to listen to stories, to go on a journey with you, uh, the, the marketer, the brand owner. And we want to know that story. What's the story of the product? What's the story of the company? Why have you even started this? What is the journey that you're on personally? And so I look at social media as a way to share my story, share the story of the people who use my products and to really create more of that emotional connection with people. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So where do you, like, what platform do you see as, is the easiest to get into that has the biggest um, effect? I know a lot of people right now are talking about Pinterest. A lot of people are saying Facebook is, is gone. We need to be focusing on Instagram. I mean, you know, most of, most of us like these startup entrepreneurs, we don't have a whole lot of time, you know, in the day and, and we're not ad agencies and we're not experts. So if I was going to invest two hours a week for my private label company or my Amazon product company or whatever, two hours a week into a social media platform, which one did you invest your time in? This is a really good question. And I kind of agree that the game has significantly changed on Facebook and Amazon. Organic search and organic reach, it's just, it's over. And you have to pay to play in those platforms, which at a certain scale, that's fine and that works. But if you're looking for a more organic reach, you have to go to platforms like Pinterest. Even YouTube is fantastic. Um, LinkedIn, like I personally, I'm looking at LinkedIn, how, cause a lot of the targeting has gone away on Facebook and yeah. it's really frustrating. You're just kind of flinging spaghetti on a wall just to see what <laughs> sticks. And if you have money to fl- flush down the toilet, go for it, do that. Um, but if you're still trying to really dial in your avatar and customer and really identify them, something like Pinterest is going to be really fantastic, but you have to know the strategies of Pinterest and you can't just send people directly to an offer. Like, if you're going to be posting on Pinterest, people want to go to a blog post to learn more about that product and then go to the product page. So you just, you have to know, um, the mindset that people are in when they're on that platform and you have to play within that framework. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So we probably got like one more minute for one more, like really awesome tip. Like if you could sit in front of 5,000 Amazon sellers and say, Hey, like, the the world is not coming to an end. Like there's still great opportunities out there. Like this is still an awesome time to be an entrepreneur. Um, what's like the one piece of advice, not even like tactically branding related, just like business mindset, like get this out of your head, put this in your head. Like what's the one thing that you would share? And I'm putting on the spot. It's a tough question. No, this is a really great question. And I want to answer it honestly and truthfully. Um, I feel like too often we hide behind our products and our company. And I truly believe that your greatest opportunity is to begin to show your face a little bit more and help people to see who you are. People want to know who they are buying from. 
it's no, it's no longer just a product name. It's actually, I want to know the individual behind this. I mean, just think of Richard Branson and Virgin and Steve Jobs and Apple. Like we wanted to know those guys. And there's a reason we wanted to know those guys because we yeah. wanted to know their personality, how they think, um, what, what they get excited about, what they focus on, what's important to them and what's not important to them. And the more that I really feel like the more that we can infuse our own values into our brand, into our products, into our messaging, the more that we're going to connect with people. And while it does repel some people, it significantly attracts and, and brings people in a very dedicated way to our brand and our products in a way that has them turn into the greatest evangelists for us, honestly. And they turn around and they tell everybody about us. Like, Tim, what is the one thing that makes you so unique that's not copyable is you, right? Like each of us are the thing that cannot be mass yep. produced in Asia. And I always knew, even when I was talking to major retailers, when I was talking to the store buyers, the media uh, customers, I knew at the end of the day that they were talking to Katie Richardson. And that, that was not copyable. And that's so important to hear because there are so many people that sell on Amazon that, that kind of sequester themselves in their spare bedroom. And they think like they're working completely autonomously and and maybe they are, but they shouldn't be like, I feel like Amazon, especially Amazon and, and, you know, we sell on Shopify and, you know, we do eBay and all that other stuff too. But, but speaking specifically about Amazon, you know, it's a tremendous, platform and it's a tremendous opportunity and it's such a great way to get started. But one of the handicaps I see of Amazon is that it causes us to limit what we think our own abilities and our own ceiling is. Like I tell people all the time, like we need to stop thinking of ourselves as Amazon sellers and think of ourselves as product sellers that use Amazon. Right. Yep. And, and it's so easy to sit and say, well, Amazon, nobody cares about me. Like nobody cares about my brand story, but like you're saying, even your Amazon packaging with your little hug towels, you know, just a little note, that stuff makes a difference. And if you don't think it makes a difference, those of you that are running like PPC, go run like your automatic campaign reports and find out how many people are actually searching for brand names and how many people are searching for like, bullcrap brand names, like names that aren't big. Like these are just little Amazon quote unquote private label brand names that people are literally searching for because they had a good experience and they want those. So, so don't undervalue yourselves. Don't, don't think that like, you know, nobody cares about the branding of your product just because you sell on Amazon and put yourself out there, whether that's, um, you know, investing more time, energy, and effort into what you're doing or investing more exposure and like what you're doing and telling your friends, I've got some good friends that sell, sell products just on Amazon. And they, they publicly share like on Facebook groups, what their brand is. And they're, they literally have people in other Amazon seller, Facebook groups buying their products because they like them. And they're not worried about like, Hey, someone's going to steal my product. They're like, they're literally branding everywhere they go. And that's so important. So thank you, Katie. I think that's you, you've thrown a lot of this, which is going to be hard to digest, but I think it's good stuff. (laughs) Well, and the interesting thing is like, if that's intimidating and scary to you, that's fine. But just know that that will limit the growth of your company. You can get to a million to maybe even 4 million by hiding. But if you want to rise to the top, you want to be known as the best in your category. You want to be known as somebody who's bringing real value, not just to Amazon, but to the world. You have to be willing to share your story and your message in a, in a greater way. And it's, going to mean showing a a piece of you in your life. Because like I was talking about earlier, we've got to make an emotional connection with people. I'm not talking about like sitting around with Kleenexes and sobbing and crying and telling our most vulnerable stories. That's not what I'm talking about, but I'm just like, Tim, I struggled with sales really early on. And then I suddenly got super good at it. And the only thing that switched is this, I went from being so worried and concerned about everybody who was looking at me and how I looked and what they were thinking of me. I had to train myself to quiet that voice and to really just focus on who's in front of me right now that needs help. Meaning like I was talking to retailers and consumers and focus on them. And if we can switch from being so worried and concerned about ourselves to focusing on them, what are their needs? How can I help them? How can I bring real value to their life? Then that fear and that worry concern about, ourselves, it just quiets. I'm not going to say it totally disappears. It never does. That's human nature. But if we can focus on them, suddenly that fear that was holding us back before is, is quieted enough that we can move forward in a powerful way. Absolutely. 
Man, thank you so much, Katie. I, we're at like 40 minute mark. So we need to start winding this thing down. But, um, you know, do you want to give like a real quick explanation of the services you offer? I know you do uh, coaching and I know you have a mastermind program. You want to take a minute here and kind of explain that? Because I suspect there are people uh, listening that are going to want to access you as a resource. So they need to know how to yeah. find you. Yeah. So I, I shared a little bit about essentially what I do, you know, the, the growth of our company is going to be limited to the capacity of ourselves as a leader, as a CEO, as a founder. And so, so much of what I do is I help people who are in the 1 million to 5 million range who are frustrated, right? They've hit the ceiling and it just seems like it doesn't matter what I do, the tactics and tricks that seem to work for everybody else, they're not working for me. And it's, it's not because you're, not doing the right things. It's who you are being in those interactions, right? In our marketing, in our conversation with our customers, with retailers, even in Amazon. And the greatest opportunity to grow our our company from 2 million to 10 or even 10 to 100 million is to grow our own capacity. And this is a lot of the work that I do within my one-on-one clients. They've tried everything and it's they're still frustrated. And so that's when they come to me. Um, I also have a mastermind where I help people who have built an amazing business, even oftentimes exclusively on Amazon. And they're looking around and they're seeing the changes in the tax laws. And they're seeing that more and more people are drop shipping from Asia. And they're trying to figure out how to add real value in the world and how to separate themselves from the competition. And to ultimately do what I was talking about before, bring their customers to them, right? Because that's way cheaper if they come to us. And so I help you separate yourself from the competition and do and follow my process, which is called not normal. (laughs) And it's not normal because honestly, Tim, like, as my business would grow, I would share stories and people would be like, do you realize that entrepreneur magazine doesn't just go to people and put them on the cover? Like that's not normal. Or, um, you know, people don't just show up on the today show without soliciting and knocking down their door. So we've got this playbook essentially for how to get your ideal customers and clients coming to you. And it's beautiful. What happens? You, you increase your enterprise value. If you want to sell your company someday, um, this is an amazing way to do it and to grow it with our not normal playbook. So, um, you can go to not normals, N T N R M L S dot com and you can find more information about us. It's me and my husband. We share the art and the science of building a powerful brand and how to really separate yourself from the competition and break past that two to four million dollar barrier and just be dominate in your category. Cause let's face it, like I'm here to have fun, Tim. And if if we're stuck, it's not fun. So that's absolutely true. That's what we do. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on. Um, really, really love your your passion, your excitement and your experience. I know that um, it's also encouraging just to hear that like, hey, you can become, you know, one of those folks on the front cover of Entrepreneur Magazine, literally um, by coming up with just a product idea and, uh, you know, in the bathtub and working in your garage, freezing your butt off. And I mean, it's cool. It's like <laughs> a cool day and age that we live in where these things are possible and these things actually can happen. They do happen. So, well, thank you so yes. much. Those of you that are listening, uh, make sure to check the show notes to, uh, to track down Katie and how you can get involved with her. If you haven't done it yet, go to YouTube, subscribe to our channel, Private Label Legion. Also go on Facebook to Private Label Legion and like our page. Join our Facebook group, Private Label Legion. Tons and tons and tons of free content in there. Um, we moderate it. We kick a bunch of the trash out. It's not spammy. It's just good, good content. Um, and then also, you know, like and follow the podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube, go to your favorite podcast player, whether it's iTunes or Google Play or or Podbean or whatever it is and like the uh, like this podcast that you get some uh, notifications of new episodes that are coming out so thank you again Katie thank you all for listening and we'll catch you guys on the next episode thank you Tim bye bye you've just wrapped up another episode of Legion Radio hosted by Tim Jordan past episodes links and show notes can be found at privatelabellegion.com